My Grandmother's Doll Just Licked Me by Double Door Bastard. My grandmother died a few weeks back at the ripe old age of 85, passing away peacefully in her sleep. By all accounts, she lived a damn good life, and I tried my very best to make it so. Lord knows she did the same for me. This has been a difficult post for me to write. You see, when a treasured loved one dies, especially one that you grew up with, the little solar system of your life is thrown completely out of orbit. Not that mine was ever all that stable in the first place. My parents died in a car accident when I was two years old, and I was a little too young at the time to fully absorb the emotional impact of being orphaned. When the prospect of being put into the foster system was brought up by the family lawyer, my grandma took me in without a second thought. Her home was our home. It's where I built my childhood. Honestly, you'd never meet a more charitable woman than my grandma. From the second I came into her life, all the way up to her death, and even beyond, she provided for me without fail. Another interesting bit about Grandma is the fact that she was mute. I'm not talking selective mutism here. I'm talking full-blown, constant silence. I've known that woman for the entire 32 years of my life, and while I got used to it within a few months, to some it seems crazy that I never heard a word from her. Of course, we had our own ways of communicating back then. I picked up sign language pretty quickly, as most kids tend to, and she used to write on this little chalkboard for me. I thought it was awfully cute at the time. I got a call from her lawyer a few days after she passed telling me that she left her entire estate to me in the will. It doesn't matter how well you know a person. That kind of thing always hits you deep. Everything that wasn't covered by your donor card now belonged to me. About a week or two passed, some papers were signed, money exchanged hands, and the wheels of bureaucracy turned as slowly as ever. My grandma's possessions became my possessions, and some eager patients became the happy recipients of grandma's remarkably healthy liver, kidneys, and lungs. Like I said, she was the giving type. The home was an old Georgian place. Two stories, three bedrooms, a well-maintained garden. I felt like a kid who just got a pony for Christmas. The problem was, I'm not a rich enough guy to pay the rent on the apartment and the house. And I'm not such a heartless bastard that I would immediately sell my childhood home either, especially on this bipolar market. I was talking to a good friend of mine over some drinks, and it was his idea that I converted into a rental property. I mulled it over when I was sober, of course, but my office job wasn't going anywhere, so I decided that being a landlord might be a welcome change of pace. That's when things started to go downhill. I showed up at the house with all my supplies on Monday. My car full of paint, tools, and industrial strength bin bags. It took me a few minutes to gather the strength to go in at first. This house has a lot of heavy history for me. Good times, bad times. Like I said, this is where I grew up. And Grandma's death had made the nostalgia all the more bitter to me. I kept telling myself, the faster I do it, the less it'll hurt. Like ripping off a band-aid. The place had barely changed since I moved out at 21. It, it kind of felt like a picture, frozen in time, waiting for my return. I guess I granted its wish in that sense. I just don't think it expected me to start tearing down the wallpaper. I was methodical, going from room to room, watching scenes from my childhood play out like a theater of the mind, before I started repainting and remodeling everything in sight. God, I forgot how ancient this place looked. Grandma's sense of style never really left the 70s. Once the first floor was bare, I dragged out all the old furniture onto the lawn. 
My drinking buddies were suspiciously absent when I needed help with the heavy lifting. I had a break for lunch, then I did some exploring. The rooms upstairs were exactly like I remembered. Grandma's room, and the bed she would never sleep in again, was laid out as neatly as ever. My room was just the same. Covered in peeling Nirvana posters and bearing all the hallmarks of your garden variety 90s teenager. When I left home, I told her to turn it into a games room, or a quiet room where she could read her books. Just something that she would enjoy. I guess she never got around to it. Or she expected me to come back someday. Tears were just welling up in my eyes when I saw that old chalkboard she had laying on her bed with welcome home smiley face written on it. The one room I hadn't checked was the attic. Back when I was a kid, I was never allowed to go up there. Grandma said, or rather wrote, that it was too dangerous. So I stayed downstairs whenever she occasionally made her pilgrimage up the hallway stairs. But grandma's dead and I'm an adult. I figured that if the attic was big enough, I could convert it into a loft room and take on another lodger. It would be more income if I was right. So it felt stupid to miss out on it. Flashlight in hand, I made my way up the stairs into the attic. The bulbs up there were long since fucked. So, my only source of light was a thin shard emitted by the flashlight. I've never been a superstitious man, but something about that attic made me feel uneasy. Naturally, at first I didn't see anything but old boxes and suitcases. I made a mental note to check those later, while I forged deeper into the surprisingly spacious attic. My eyes were on the money and the chances of being able to install a room up here were looking hopeful. Then, a shape caught the beam of my flashlight, and I felt my heart skip a beat. It was shaped like a leg. Like a baby's leg. Like it had been ripped from the socket. I rushed over to take a closer look, and felt the greatest relief of my life when I realized that it was only plastic. Shortly after that, a second wave of creep set in. Because what was a plastic baby leg doing in my grandma's attic? I picked it up and swept the entire area with a flashlight. Until I caught something familiar in the corner. That didn't make it any less weird though. There were dolls. Hundreds of fucking dolls. Big, old, small, new, expensive, cheap porcelain dolls to Barbie dolls, to American Girl dolls to Cabbage Patch dolls. Various sizes, shapes, materials, colors. I almost dropped the flashlight when I saw their dead eyes glaring at me, thinking my grandma was the next Rose West, until I realized that they were all fake. They were arranged in a big pile like some kind of shrine. Once my heartbeat normalized again, I took a few steps closer letting my flashlight cut through all the gloom. So, my grandma had been collecting these for years, and she never wanted me to see them? Not a bad call, actually. They made me feel uncomfortable now. God knows what they would have done to me 20 years earlier. While I'm sure they had a lot of sentimental value to grandma, they sure as hell didn't have any to me, and I figured that no lodgers would want to stay in a home that seemed like some sort of demented serial killer person-sized dollhouse. They had to go. All of them. I fetched a bin bag from the car and started packing up some of the smaller ones, just chipping away at Mount Creepy bit by bit. The way Grandma had stacked them didn't even leave them all visible. It was dolls on top of dolls on top of dolls, each one just as horrible as the last all except one. I found her lurking underneath all the others, her face buried in the back of a tatty old rag doll. It was like she didn't want to be seen, or my grandma didn't want me to find her. She was bigger than the rest, about the size of a four-year-old child, with slightly off proportions. 
Her little pinched up face was molded from rubber and plastic. Her hair, long and black, looked like fiber optic tubing. It's one of those things that are difficult to put into words, but something about her just repulsed me. Maybe it was those vacant blue eyes or that little silk dress that reminded me of one of those post-mortem photographs they took of children in the Victorian era. It just felt eerie and wrong. Reaching out to touch her, the flashlight clenched between my teeth, felt like I was reaching out to grab a live tarantula. She was a lot heavier than I expected her to be. The torch glare revealed tiny scratches and imperfections in the plastic, making her look even uglier. Another thing I noticed when the light was shining directly on her face was that her mouth was closed. The rubber on her tiny, lifelike lips wasn't sealed, they just were closed. There was a black slit running between them. I have never felt as disgusted in my entire life as I did when I watched those little lips twitch, like something was moving behind her dead face. My initial thought was animatronics, like dolls that were designed to suckle on little bottles when you put them in their mouths. But this doll looked way too old for that kind of technology. So being curious like a certain dead cat, I put my thumb on the doll's chin and gently slid open her mouth. In the darkness, something was shining. The doll had a tongue, a human tongue. Not a severed piece of flesh rotting away in there, but a moving, wiggling, salivating tongue. It came bulging out past the lips, writhing lazily before licking my thumb. It was hot and damp and stank of cigarettes. I screamed, dropping the flashlight to the ground and hurled the doll at the wall. I bolted in the darkness on memory alone, knocking over boxes and leaping over suitcases before tumbling down the stairs in a panic. I must have cleared the second floor faster than any human being alive, spraying straight through the door, not even looking back. The front door was left wide open, and the lawn was still covered in furniture, but I didn't care. The home was out of the way anyway, so if someone made the effort to come down here, they could take whatever they wanted. Fuck that doll, fuck that house. I jammed my keys into the ignition and took off like a gunshot, leaving the neighborhood at three times the legal speed limit. It must sound crazy now, I know, but logic was the furthest thing from my mind. I tore away from my home at 80 miles an hour. I didn't feel safe until I was in my flat. The door slammed and locked behind me. I was hyperventilating for a little while. I threw up once and almost fainted twice. At the time, I tried to justify it, assuming that it must have been all the cheap fumes from the paint making me see things, making me kooky. I had been under so much stress lately, I had gotten so little sleep. It's no wonder I'm imagining such ridiculous things. Fear is exhausting. It takes a physical toll on you. Once the initial shockwaves had passed, I couldn't think about anything else but sleep. God, I was so tired. I could barely stand. Moments later, I collapsed onto my bed, fully clothed. I was asleep before I even knew it. Sleep wasn't much of a reprieve. I kept dreaming about that fucking doll, crawling all over my paralyzed body like a spider, dragging its warm, stinking tongue across my face. No matter how hard I tried, there was no pushing it from my mind. Its little blue eyes were branded into my thoughts. When I woke up the next morning, I felt like I had taken a 12-gauge blast to the face. My head throbbed, my skin burned. I just felt so itchy all over, like my bed had been swarmed by fire ants. Over time, the itches became more localized. When I realized I could feel it definitively on my forearm, I peeled back my sleeve to take a look. It was a patch of skin that had gone hard and smooth, and I mean rigid, like rock solid. It had almost a reflective quality to it, where the hair had somehow fallen out. The skin around it itched like hell, but 
when I went to touch the patch itself, I didn't feel anything. I found more of these patches on my body when I inspected myself in the bathroom mirror. These hard, reflective, feelingless patches. There was one on my inner thigh, one on my belly, two on my chest, and another on my left bicep. When I tried to peel one of the patches away, it just started bleeding. The patches weren't growing on my skin. The patches were my skin. The next day, I had an appointment with my GP about the issue. I stripped off in his office, letting him see the patches. A few more had grown on my legs since last time. And worst of all, he seemed equally baffled. I must admit, these are extraordinary circumstances. He said, while trying and failing, to cross-reference my symptoms against the known diseases on the medical database. I can't say I've personally seen anything like this before. Doctor, please, I pleaded with him, trying my best to stop myself from itching the patches. There has to be something you can do for me, something you can give me, like a pill or an ointment. He'd fallen silent reading more small type text on the screen. Well, I can book you an appointment with a dermatologist. Great. When's the soonest he can see me? Not until next week, I'm afraid. Next week? But doctor, I can't wait till next week. I'm afraid he doesn't have any appointments prior to Wednesday of next week. If you feel as though it escalates severely before then, contact A&E through the standard emergency number. In the hospital, they'll take care of you as best as they can. I'm sorry, but this is all I can offer. Things just got worse after that. I penciled in my date with a dermatologist onto my kitchen wall calendar, but my skin condition was just worsening. The patches were covering at least a third of my body by Wednesday. They'd grown on my arms, legs, ass, back, and chest. My stomach, too. They were even starting to grow on my face. I couldn't even go into a well-lit room without the patches of my skin shining. It all came to a head Wednesday night, as I stood before the bathroom mirror. A patch of shiny, hard skin was beginning to grow on my cheek, making it hard to move my face. I picked at the ragged edges of the soft skin, wincing in pain while I did, until I noticed a piece of loose skin sticking out from my face, just on the edge of a patch. I grabbed it between my thumb and forefinger and started pulling. A long swath of translucent, soft skin peeled away from my face, revealing more rigid and reflective skin underneath. A few seconds later, I vomited into the bathroom sink. This is the last straw. It pushed me over the edge. The floodgates of rationality gave way to a maddening truth. It was that fucking doll. I had to put a stop to it. I had to know what the hell was going on with me. I got into the car with the kitchen knife slid into my belt and started driving towards my grandma's house. It was foggy out, low visibility, real horror movie weather. I was too angry to be afraid, too shocked to be uneasy. Soon there was going to be more of that awful plastic skin than there was real skin. I'd look like some perverse shop window mannequin. The furniture was still all over the front yard when I arrived. The front door was still wide open. Nothing had been touched. Frozen. A picture. Just waiting for me. I have to do it. Fast. I thought. If I do it fast, it'll hurt less. Like ripping off a band-aid. Christ. What deja vu. I stormed through the front door and barged upstairs, knife in one hand and flashlight in the other. My footsteps slowed as I trudged through the second floor, then the attic stairs. The fear and trepidation were settling in. It felt palpable, as if it were squeezing me. Or maybe it was just my skin. The attic, like everything else, was the exact same as I left it. That bastard doll was still there, too. I could see it faintly, its face to the ground, its body crumpled up in the corner where I threw it, where it belonged. I held the flashlight in my teeth again and headed over to the doll, 
remembering its bizarre weight. I grabbed it by the scruff of its dirty silk shirt and yanked it up into my arms. Once again, the harsh light was shining directly onto the doll's face. Oh dear God. The doll. It, it was covered in patches of skin. My skin. My soft, pink skin. Some of the patches were sporadic. Some were close together. But it was unmistakable. The doll was somehow growing new skin. Growing my skin. While the skin on my body turned to rigid plastic. I dropped the doll and stumbled backwards. The knife clinking on the floor and the flashlight rolling off. Casting errant shadows on the wall. My skin was on fire again. My head was spinning. I vomited on the ground and clung against the wall, trying to steady myself in a world that just didn't make sense anymore. Just then, my phone buzzed in my pocket. Resurrecting me from my trance, I pulled it out and answered with a trembling hand. Then I held it to my ear. Hello, this is Dr. Samsa speaking. I know you don't know me, and I'm sorry to call you from home, but I'm one of the doctors who performed the post-mortem appendectomy on your grandma last week. I wasn't going to call, but something has been bothering me recently. What? I replied in a monotone voice, barely in this world. Your grandma. She was nonverbal, wasn't she? Yeah. When did she have the prosthetic fit? This jogged me out of my haze. I'm sorry. What prosthetic? I don't follow. Her prosthetic tongue, sir. My blood ran cold. W what? Her prosthetic tongue. I wasn't even aware such a thing existed. In all honesty, it appeared to be polymer-based, but it was so perfectly fused with the tissue in her jaw, it didn't seem like any old replacement part. Perhaps she had some kind of bonding agent that was used as well? I dropped the phone while the doctor just rambled on. He was wrong, of course but he had given me the final piece of this whole insane puzzle. Yeah, it all made sense after that. When you touch the doll, it takes things from you. It took my grandmother's tongue a long time ago. Now, it's taking my skin. And I can't imagine that we were the first. There were some donors out there that made the doll that heavy. I walked from the attic, silent almost catatonic and sat in my car. I didn't move for quite some time, and the sideways glances I made towards the house, I could have sworn I saw the doll standing at the second story window, staring down at me. But who knows, the mind plays tricks. Time is short, I'm running out of skin. Thankfully, my fingers have lasted this long, but I don't expect them to be here much longer. It's only a matter of time before I'm a prisoner of my skin. The doll's out there now, somewhere. Just a leaf in the wind. And if that somewhere is near you, I hope to God you don't touch it. Because the last time I saw it, it still needed plenty of parts. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my $10 and above patrons, Paul Z, Mr. Swiston, Official Jerboa, Chaos X, JY Pyromancer, and Hayden MH. Thank you all so much. If you guys want access to special Patreon-only content, I'm going to try to put out around two stories a month that are just for patrons. They'll be a little too extreme for the tubs, so if you guys want access to that and you want your name mentioned at the end of the video and put down in the description, head over to Patreon. Thank you for watching.